Hey, hey, people. Epilepsy warning. I'm serious. You have about three seconds. Now that all the epileptics are either dead or convulsing, let's have a pleasant time. High Fleet is self-described as a fleet carrier sim, programmed entirely inside an ice fishing shack by a single Russian man. Personally, I describe it as an immersive trauma sim, because the hardest part isn't the combat, it's staying calm when all your senses are drowned out by the scream of gunfire. The game takes place on the fictional desert planet of Kazakhstan. After a messy political revolution, rebel forces forces have taken over. You play as Grand Duke Mark Syadi Solemsky, who is tasked by the Russian Emperor himself, Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin, to restore order. Unfortunately, our forces to the south got glassed by thermonuclear warheads, so you could say it's not going too well. Our last-ditch effort is to push north towards the rebel-controlled city of Kiva. Our objective? A plutonium reactor the size of a city, responsible for the vast majority of power generation across the planet. The hope is, once once we capture it, the enemy will have to surrender, or at least negotiate a truce. However, you're vastly outnumbered, outgunned, and flat out broke. But first, let's get to the controls. Your word of the day, skewmorphism. Every part of a UI looks like the real world equivalent of what it's meant to represent. On the map, you're looking top down from the cockpit, which is crammed with whatever communications devices you've got installed. This may look overwhelming, but compared to an actual Soviet cockpit, it's comparatively simple. Generally, if you make visual contact, it's already too late. The enemy has already spotted our chemtrail, so there's no point acting innocent. Which is why we use all of this shit. At the top left, you've got your radar. Reliable, accurate, and high resolution. The good radar, also known as the overpriced radar, has a range of 700 kilometers. Check this out. Not only does it locate, but if I make contact, mark it on the map, and maintain course for exactly an hour, I can mark the new position, take a ruler between the two points, and find out the velocity and bearing of a signal. But you have to send radio signal to receive it, which means if you see them, they can definitely see you. So sometimes the best option is to turn it off and start panicking. Unfortunately, this sound means our infrared search and track system is working correctly. What does this mean? It means there's a ballistic missile coming towards us. And since infrared is low range at 300 kilometers, it also means brace yourself. In contrast, Electronic Intelligence, or ELINT, works off passive radar emission, so it's undetectable, long range, and looks like a fucking pretend phone for kids. It's very intuitive. I look at it, see the flashing red light which says, alert, danger close, and I look away, trying to guess whatever the hell that means. Then there is the radar jammer. You can click it for stress relief, because it doesn't do anything. Imagine getting shot dead in the street, an experience that many Americans can relate to. But as the bullet approaches, you can briefly become invisible. This amazing ability allows you to sneak away from the approaching bullet. However, the only problem is that bullets are typically much faster. Finally, you've got the radio, which intercepts radio transmission in real time. You'll have to dial in the correct frequency, tune the signal, and get a bearing on its direction. You only get a short window of time to do this before you lose the transmission. Even if you get it, surprise, it's usually encrypted. Even if you decrypt it, surprise, it's literally a trucker asking for gas. Every single time, the tactical knowledge of where every trucker stops to urinate is vital to the success of your campaign. There's also some other keys to the top right. Those are buttons to commit war crimes, and if you flick the switch, you can control the number of atrocities you'd like to commit. Finally, Finally, I can actually talk about the game. In this game, Modern Warfare has done away with tanks and aviation. Instead, we fly gigantic 30,000 ton blocks of steel, which guzzle 2,000 cubic tons of pressurized methane every thousand kilometers, with a carbon emission rating between who cares and it's probably gonna get warmer. Every ship is unique and complementary to the rest of your fleet, which you pick at the start of a campaign. Every ship piece is modular, which can be swapped out and modified as you see fit. There's no safety or handhold so, by all means, detach the bridge from your flagship, tumble to your death, and lose the game. But if you can resist the urge of destroying or selling your flagship, we should get moving. Because it's only a matter of time before some Soviet babushka alerts the authorities. So start your engines and pick a destination. Whatever your choice, expect heavy resistance. To make matters more complicated, you can't just send your flagship. Because it's a fat, heavy piece of shit that tops out at 90 kilometers an hour. Why is this an issue? Because the enemy will spot us, raise the alarm, and send every strike fleet to our location. Pro tip, if you start hearing the 
this music, you're already dead. Which is why I usually just dismantle my flagship into a 2x2 cardboard box and fly it into the desert. I can't lose if I can't be found. So instead, we send a strike group ahead of the main fleet to kill everyone before they can scream for help. Combat is very simple. You take your diazepam, stare at the drywall for 10 minutes, and return to the PC. Then watch as you get locked on by three different ships. It's a trial by fire, but eventually you'll get the hang of it. Typically, you fill your magazine, unload on the enemy, and try to live long enough to reload. And yes, you always fight 1v3. Get used to it. And yes, depending on the weather and time of day, you're going to see a lot of rain. Conversely, you're not going to see much else. Think of every ship in this game as a crab. Punch through its exoskeleton, and there's nothing but soft, tender flesh. The slightest crack in its armor, the slightest puncture in its crusty, and you'll devour the whole thing. There's a structural diagram of whatever ship you're targeting on the bottom right. You can use this to figure out the weak points of any high-altitude crustacean. Fun fact, pressurized methane is very explosive. Locate their fuel tanks, set them on fire, and the chain reaction will usually blow the whole ship. Do you need to know anything else? No. Is there long-term health consequences to flying a ship that knocks out the pilot each time I make a turn? Yeah, probably. But afterwards, there's a lot of burning debris and human bodies that you have to mop up before we can properly land. You're on a limited timer, and you can't save everything, or everyone, because the game will automatically try to save crew members trapped inside the debris. However, those aren't mine. I should know, because I don't build evac pods on my ships. Think about it. The Titanic would have never crashed if it had no life vessels. If the passengers had no option for retreat, they'd plug the hole with their bloated carcasses and save the day. So instead, I switch to manual and write off those casualties as fatalities. First, First, we secure the fuel and munitions, because if they burn, they explode, taking our payday along with it. Then, check your options. Crew quarters contain souvenirs for recruiting potential allies. Captain's quarters contains clues to the location of aforementioned allies. Useful, but not essential. Radio room gives a piece of a current encryption key. Absolutely, totally, and completely worthless. If you know a single keyword, you can decrypt the entire transmission. That leaves us with the only thing that actually matters. Spare parts, we can strip down and sell for money. Gun parts, missiles, radars, aircraft. Whatever it is, it's worth a lot of cash back in town. If they got that money symbol, it's time to harvest as quickly as possible. Sometimes there's a hazard warning, which means a 50% chance of horrific accident if you don't put on protective gear. But that takes time, and I don't have a lot of time, but I do have a lot of expendable, replaceable human beings. You know what they say? You can't cook an omelet without breaking health and safety. After your profitable cleanup, you can open the hatch. Welcome to town. It's a fucking dump, but sometimes it rains. It's the only moment of serene tranquility you'll ever get in this game. Usually, there's a random event, which influences the worldview and politics of your crew, depending on how you respond. For example, your men start taking slaves from the captured enemy captives. What do you do? Option 1. Slavery bad. No slavery. Option 2. Slavery good. Receive 5,000 credits. Option 3. Slavery Slavery good, but not efficient. Assign a slavery officer to oversee and optimize slavery. Receive 10,000 credits. Choices are not made equal. Some are straight up better. At some point in the game, rising nuclear ash keeps dropping the temperature. Your general tells you the men are freezing to death, suggesting that you keep the car engine running and burn a small amount of fuel even if you're currently parked. If you agree, temporary plus free morale bonus to all of your men, and a permanent drain on fuel supply for the rest of the game. If you say no, absolutely nothing happens. It's never brought up again. Worldview is used for skill checks along the story and for charismatic negotiation with Tarkans, former Russian generals who are currently in hiding from rebel forces. Appeal to their sense of morality, give them a nice Funko Pop, and they just might join your campaign so that I can immediately sell their ship for market value. This involves giving a speech, the effect of which is specific to each character's sensibilities. Mainly, I just rant about how much I fucking hate the poor, and how much money we're gonna make after we kill, sorry, after we shove a gun barrel of democracy down the collective throats of a current government. My impassioned speech is often very convincing. Tarkans are valuable assets, which can be called up during the campaign to ask for a small loan of 10,000, repeatedly until they no longer pick up. A city is effectively a gas station. We drop into the Gazprom depot to get scammed by shitty gas prices by some dude 
wearing a sack. Every gas station also comes equipped with a Shipworks for ship installation and repair. You can do this undocked at low speed, but for serious repairs, you're going to have to manually land the ship. Welcome to parking, the quickest and most frequent cause of a game over. Much like jumping down a flight of stairs without legs, do not attempt to do this without landing gear. And remember to park your flagship responsibly. Sometimes it'll count balancing off a cliff as a completely valid parking spot. You'll return to the town screen only to see your flagship tumble and crash into the abyss. Also, for some reason, after parking your ship, you can still control it. You might think it's a bug, but it's never been fixed, so I suspect it's working as intended. Moving on, every gas station has an in-store self-check out to legally purchase special munitions to be used against the same government that sold it to me. Compatibility depends on weapon caliber. For reference, the smallest caliber in this game is a 37mm machine gun. This goes up to 180mm, which is the size of your average artillery. And there's no option for weapon groups, so typically we fire every single gun at the same time. As far as I care, there's only two types of ammo, armor piercing and proximity fuse. The former for cutting up ships and the latter for chopping up aircraft. The rest is a complete meme. Incendiary starts fires, which implies that 2,000 cubic tons of burning methane just wasn't enough. And laser guided lets you do this. Honestly, I really do like it, but when I remember that I'm effectively shooting money, my brow begins to sweat and I start to feel nauseous. Besides that, there's a bunch of bombs, missiles, and rockets you can use to airstrike the enemy before they can even start their engines. With that out of the way, you should remember that any military campaign is largely financial, and that the most beautiful phrase in the Russian language is Дай мне твоё деньги. Pajalista. We are going to intercept trade convoys, murder their escort, and capture the trade ships so we can hold them for ransom. Because we're the good guys. God is with us on this campaign. And thus, piracy is absolutely ethical, encouraged, and the best way of making money hands down. Besides selling ballistic nuclear weapons on the open market. Speaking of ballistic nuclear weapons, why haven't we used them yet? Because, as your general puts it, once the genie's out of a bottle, it's never going back inside. But I'm okay with that, because I only have one wish to make. I wish for a nuclear winter. The death of one is a tragedy, but the death of millions is a good start. However, in retrospect, this wasn't the best idea. You see, we didn't use them because we couldn't. We didn't use them because they have more than us. Considerably more. And right now, they're heading towards us. So, word of advice, they won't touch the button as long as you don't. You can start the nuclear war, but they're going to finish it. Finally, if you actually want to win the game, pre-built ships aren't good enough. You have to make your own. You do this by clicking Shipworks in the main menu. Unfortunately, the latest patch has removed the background sound effects because somebody kept complaining. Luckily, I still have my old copy, so I can still tune in to the soothing ASMR of a Middle Eastern repair shop. Here's some of the projects I made after stealing and taking credit for them from a friend. The block, the brick, the cock and ball accelerator, which generates torque directly from the phallus, the box, the Death Star of David, work in progress, the windmill of friendship, footage missing, the fly swatter, also known as the make shit crash, because enemies will desperately try to avoid mid-air collision, which instead makes them crash into the ground, the when you run out of ammo, you become the ammo, the why did I make this, and many more. Eventually, I realized that armor plates are functionally no different to reinforced hull pieces, except they weigh three times as much, so I made this abomination. It can take out every strike fleet in the game back to back with no breaks. I can literally sit in the first town, wait until grandma calls the Gestapo, and watch as the entire rebel military explode in front of me. I love this game. Which brings me to my main critique. There's not enough, and I want more. It's like a slice of cake that I want, but I can't have, because I can't legally imprison the developer until he bakes the aforementioned cake. Unless I... Unless I somehow invite him over on false pretenses, burn his passport, and cuff him to the work table.
Hypothetically, of course. Also, if you're worried about epilepsy, just know that modern copies of a game have been sanitized for your delicate eyes. You can set your preference in the options menu. Thanks to all the seizure complaints, Glitch High is now just a bunch of fuzzy lines. But on release, Glitch High was the equivalent of burning out your cornea with a radioactive lens flare. It was actually even funnier because the options used to be flipped. So you'd set it to Glitch Low, which would actually be Glitch High. And very soon, both your retinas would cease to function and die. If you're interested, you can grab a copy on Steam, or you can physically steal it by cutting the fiberglass cables outside your house and intercepting the individual packets of light. As always, more content to come, hopefully more often, so stay tuned. A warm thanks to the many members of the Merchants Guild generously funding and bankrolling these videos. You're all truly wonderful. Have a good one.